So um, one of the things I've appreciated about uh, Calusa is the number of um, texts or emails I'll get that I'll not be in town, so, um, or I won't be in worship or whatever. So the month of August is looking lean um, in terms of people coming and going. And in all honesty, I don't know whether or not I'm coming and going either. So just trying to keep on top of things, that'll be great. <coughs> um, and it just seems so ironic that, you know, we're getting kind of a cool down. Doesn't, I don't know, the morning in Rockland this morning, it was 60 degrees in Rockland this morning. It just felt so great. I don't know what, it, it was what? So what's the high supposed to be today? 93. And, and Jim and I, this afternoon, are headed for Medford to, on our way north. And it's supposed to be 101 today in Medford. So what are, what are we doing this for? <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, as a result of that, the Wednesday night Bible study, will, the Zoom Bible study will not be meeting. We'll meet the week after that. But you're always encouraged to join with us. And if you uh, decide that you want to join up with the group, just let me know. And I'll send you the study materials out that I send out every week to the group that's been meeting together. And uh, we're going to start into Matthew, and we're just a little bit behind the Tuesday reading program, but um, we'd love to have you um, join us and be part of that if you would like to join us on those days. Just a quick reminder for any deacons in the room, we are not meeting um, <clears throat> this coming week. Our next deacons meeting is on September the 8th, so if you could be mindful of that and get it registered, that would be extremely helpful as well. Um, let's join together for a moment of prayer. Lord, we're grateful for this opportunity to come together as a body. Um, to enjoy the friendships and the fellowship that we have between one another. And um, we just give you thanks for your abundant goodness in our lives. Uh, we pray for those who aren't able to be with us in worship today. Um, if they're ill in any way, shape, or form, we pray that your hand will be upon them and that you will bring restoration to their, to their health. If they're on the road, Lord, <clears throat> or out about uh, doing something special with friends or family. Today we ask for your protection upon them and that um, we will have the opportunity to enjoy their presence once again. And Lord, we're just so grateful for the abundant blessings that you bestow upon us. And one is for the opportunity for us to come and to share our lives with one another, to pray for one another, to uphold one another, and to, um, Give thanks for the, the, the amazing gift of your love for us demonstrated through the Christ. And we give you thanks in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ, in whom we pray. Amen. If you're able, uh, we encourage you to stand and join with us in song. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you jesus the name above jesus the name above every other name jesus the only one i could ever say jesus the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead. In your love to those around me. 
Worthy of every song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around. I will build and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken. For every sickness. For every sickness, you're the healing hand. For every prisoner, your deliverance. For every loss, oh, you're the promised land. Our breakthrough, you're our breakthrough. Out of the ashes, you make beautiful. When there is no way, you're the miracle. And only you do the impossible. Our breakthrough, you're our breakthrough. Cause every mountain moves with a word from you. They surrender to your glory and majesty. When it waves obey, the power of your name, Jesus, we proclaim your glory and majesty. Your majesty. For every sickness, for every sickness, you're the healing hand. For every prisoner, your deliverance. For every lost soul, you're the promised land. Our breakthrough, you're our breakthrough. Out of the ashes, you make beautiful. When there is no way, you're the miracle. And only you do the impossible. Our breakthrough, you're our breakthrough. Every mountain moves with a word from you. They surrender to your glory and majesty. 
When did waves obey the power of your name? Jesus, we proclaim your glory and majesty. Your majesty. We will not forget. We will not forget to remember your goodness. We will not forget to remember your faithfulness. We will not forget to remember your goodness. We will not forget. We will not forget. Cause every mountain moves with a word from you. They surrender to your glory and majesty. Wind and waves obey the power of your name. Jesus, we proclaim your glory and majesty. As every mountain moves with a word from you, they surrender to your glory and majesty. Wind and waves obey the power of your name. Jesus, we proclaim your glory and majesty. Your majesty. Good morning. Um, I'm up here again to uh, help us figure out what we're grateful for and what we need to ask God to uh, help us with and um, maybe point out some times when this week Jesus showed up and uh, things worked out miraculously, sort of like the song said. So um, does anyone have... Uh, a time they'd like to share where they have a praise for something that happened this week or happened in your life sometime? Uh, Harriet sends her greetings and uh, she's uh, in day 17 and uh, she's uh, been somewhat confined for 20 days as a result of her surgery and she's really doing well and she thanks you for her prayers. All right, amen. Anybody else? Uh, once again, I talked to Pat Wesley. Um, for some reason, the bone that had broken her back has fused itself. So now she's not having to wear that uh, horrible, uh, what is it called? Brace. Well, it's a, it's a straight jacket is what it is. <laughs> and I, I told her she'd always, uh, I figured she'd end up with one someday. <laughs> and I also want to give thanks for the wonderful friends I've made in this church, not only now, but through the years. It is amazing. I was thinking this earlier this week that um, sometimes our prayer requests are really far reaching now, but it feels like the people that we're praying for are still really close. So like we were praying for Judy Coons, who's been gone for a while, but it feels like you're praying for someone that you actually know and see all the time, which is really cool about this church. Any other praises? Oh, let me give you the microphone. Um. She has asked for prayers. She is still considered to be in critical condition. There is internal bleeding, and they can't find where the internal bleeding is coming from, so it's affecting her kidney function. And if they could solve the problem of the internal bleeding, it would hopefully get her kidneys working. Either way, she will have a, a long recovery. Um, and her daughter Vicki is home. Um, I have a praise. We got to go see Molly um, yesterday, um, and we she's starting a new job, so we helped her 
unpack her classroom and get it all organized and hang bulletin boards and things like that just because it's so overwhelming for these new teachers. Not only do they have to learn how to teach this curriculum, they have to decorate their rooms, they, it's just overwhelming. Anyway, it was super fun being there with Molly and getting to do that and just being nice and cool. It was 65 degrees. Um, but then I have a, pray, a prayer that um, we, I just wanna pray for all the teachers getting ready to go back and the students and the parents. Let me pray for Judy first before I forget. Um, Lord, just as a body, we want to lift up Judy to you. And um, I pray that this internal bleeding would stop. And if it doesn't stop, Lord, I pray that they can find out where it is and they can stop it. And I just pray for um, her to be su surrounded with people who can comfort her um, as she goes through this long recovery. And Lord, I also, I do want to lift up uh, the teachers, the students, the parents as um, everyone in our county and, and around the state is slowly transitioning back into class, Lord. Um, I just pray that uh, somehow in the craziness of how education is now that um, there would be people following you and uh, leading kids in the right direction in your name. I have a praise for um, just in general, wonderful, wonderful uh, time with uh, our daughter who had a birthday on Friday, so there was a big uh, family dinner, which I did. And then uh, she had another dinner at her house on Saturday, which I went over and helped her with, which was super fun. And a lot of her uh, coworkers and uh, neighbors and so forth that she and her husband hosted. But the, um, it's, it's just wonderful just wonderful to have those opportunities and uh, to share those special moments with your children, even though they're really getting old. <laughs> well, I was just thinking how cool it is that Molly had two experienced teachers help her set up her classroom. But also kind of like what, what Betty was saying, um, just got back last week from a trip to Disneyland with my daughter and her family and just the joy of grandchildren and being close enough to see them frequently and just the joy of a good relationship with you know an adult child and her family um, just the you know families and communities that God gives us um. I did talk to uh, Chris and uh, Margie. Uh, uh, they flew back there just recently uh, to be with uh, Judy. And this morning the text was that um, she's doing better this morning. And that uh, she actually texted back and said, uh, good morning, Sherman. So I thought, well, that's positive. So keep praying. <laughs> This past weekend, I traveled to Oregon. Um, one of there was four of us girls that lived together, and um, my friend Joan was celebrating her 50th wedding anniversary. And not too many people do that anymore. And then the in-laws were celebrating their 50th as well, and then her daughter, her 20th. So, thumbs up for marriage, but also for the wonderful friendship of these women that I've had for the last 50 years. And we're all still healthy and going strong, so praise God. We are celebrating our granddaughter's 16th birthday today. And it's going to be lots of fun, and we're so proud of her. Just a blessing to the family. Talking about going back to school, uh, I don't know how many of you know uh, Molly Ajua, <clears throat> but uh, she's been kind of out of uh, education for quite a few years, and uh, this will be her first time returning to the classroom, and uh, we're just overjoyed that, uh, that she's going to be working again. I think she's working in the Williams Unified School District, and she's gonna be teaching special aid, which is really an area that she's very good at. 
Uh, also, uh, speaking about education, I think you know that my grandson uh, is in China and has been now for, what, 13 years? And uh, in December, of course, what happened, the twins were born. And so <clears throat> subsequently, uh, his home, or actually his wife's home, is a great distance from the school that he was teaching in. And he really loved teaching in that school, and he had been progressing and doing very well. But uh, he wanted to be closer to his, uh, his sons, and so subsequently he had to leave this really wonderful job that he had and was fortunate to find another school. And he has started, I believe, on the 29th uh, at a new school, which is an international school. So this will be the first time that he's, he'll be teaching uh, English. I mean, he'll be teaching Ch uh, English, but he'll also be teaching elementary Chinese, which is kind of interesting for an American to be in China teaching Chinese to international children. Uh, he, <laughs> He's also going to have to teach such things as current events and, and social studies, which is going to be really interesting to find out what he's going to be teaching these young international kids. Uh, he's actually teaching third and fourth grade, so I don't think he'll do a lot of damage. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for bringing us together and uh, just the theme of... Uh, how great it is that you made it so we would have families and, uh, and people to care about. And Lord, I just uh, pray that you bless the rest of our service in your name. Amen. Oh, 
Spirit, come make us humble. Psalm 51 is one of the penitential psalms. This was written by David after he was confronted by the prophet Nathan for adultery with Bathsheba and orchestrating the death of her husband. And it contains in it what I think is the most desperate plea we could ever, ever give. Um, Cast me not away from your presence, O God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Let's join together in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your goodness unto us. We thank you for the psalm that has read, been read to us, for the deep truths that are contained within it, for the lessons that can be learned if we endeavor to grasp the depth of David's plea and the certainty of his hope in you. These things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Um, <clears throat> this morning on my handout for our message, I have uh, John 15, 1 through 17, and it talks about the vine and the branches. And, and I have that there because it frames a context for this morning, but we're not going to address it. We're going to address it on the first Sunday of September um, and also on the first Sunday of October. And we're just going to work our way through that text. This morning is kind of a preliminary to that text. Um, over the years... Uh, Jim and I have had the amazing opportunity to travel. It has absolutely baffled us. We could have never imagined it. And we have been in some enormous, uh, breathtaking basilicas and cathedrals. And sometimes, uh, early on, I, I just, you know, it, it was so overwhelming and and in, in all honesty, um, all that I saw when I was in there were dollar signs. Um, there's one called the, the Baroque Cathedral. Oh, that's its nickname in Germany. And um, um, all of us in the room could retire and live a life of pleasure with all of the gold that is in that facility. It just, it's white and gold. And it glistens everywhere. Um, but along the way, I begin discovering that the cathedrals are one of the earliest visual aids um, in modern history, even though they date back ages. And there are even books written on how to read a cathedral. Many of the cathedrals, especially in Europe, were written before there were Bibles in a published form available to people. How was the message communicated? And when you walk into many cathedrals, even to this day, there'll be a brochure there that'll walk you through the windows if you want to take advantage of it. But cathedrals are like walking into a cinema for us today. 
Because every window portrays a spiritual truth and passage from Scripture. And so if you'll take the time to go into a cathedral and begin walking, finding out where you start in that cathedral, you can literally walk your way all the way through the Bible. And the cathedrals were built for those who didn't know how to read, who didn't have the access of a Bible at their hands, that they could walk into the cathedral and in a relatively short period of time begin to engage in the stories of the scriptures and the events of scripture that all come to a place right here at the table. Changed my whole perspective in terms of what gets integrated into a worship space. And yes, worship spaces can become places that are idols in a sense, unless you dig deep enough to try to understand what's transpiring within that. <clears throat> if you've never been into St. Mary's, the new St. Mary's in San Francisco, the sculpture that hangs from the ceiling over the communion table is just breathtaking. It's absolutely breathtaking. And if you'll take time to just sit there and gaze upon it and think about the spiritual symbolism that is held in there in the context of our faith, it's, it's incredible. I'm not trying to be critical, but I think that's one of the things that has been lost in the, in the modern church. What is oftentimes referred to as the box church. It's so devoid of visual symbolism which is part of the learning experience for many people. They learn visually. They don't learn audibly. They don't, they learn visually. Jema can't think unless she can doodle. Her doodles are amazing, you know? Um, and and Jema says to me, why don't you ever doodle? Well, because one stick, two sticks, three, four in a circle, that's it for a doodle for me. Sometimes over the years I would grow cynical, <clears throat> especially of those very liturgical traditions and, and um, what their pastors would wear. One of my friends in college who was going to be, was en route to become an Episcopal priest spoke to me one week and he said, <clears throat> I've been invited to assist in the dressing of the bishop at the cathedral in downtown Spokane. I can bring a guest in with me. Would you like to come? Sure. So I find myself in this room that's about 10 by 12 and the bishop is stripped down to his skivvies and then there began to become an attitude change. From that point on, it took an hour to dress the bishop. Every piece of clothing was associated with a passage of scripture. After the scripture was read and the garment was placed on him, those attending to him gathered around him and prayed that passage of scripture and the significance of that piece of garment now, a bishop wears about 10 layers of garments. And I sat there, and I just felt the Lord penetrating me. Because I had, the thing that was going through my mind is, are the people in the congregation, are they mindful of what, of, all the symbolism that's present there? Are they mindful of the deep biblical truths that that bishop, in a sense, wears in their presence. In the Protestant world, you haven't seen one very often here over the years and years and years here, that the very simple gown that Protestant pastors wear, it's actually um, an academic robe. It speaks to their education. There's one part of the robe, though, that has spiritual significance, and it's that piece of velvet 
that oftentimes goes around it. It's referred to as the yoke of Jeremiah. And it's to remind the pastor that he carries his congregation on his shoulders. They are his responsibility. And like Jeremiah, he may be called to weep on their behalf. Well, you know, something that's been lost. We've had the joy of worshiping in some amazing, or being part of some amazing facilities. One reminds me not because of the symbolism within the sanctuary, but <clears throat> when I was at Wabash Presbyterian Church on the Enumclaw Plateau, the sanctuary was extremely large. It didn't have a lot of symbolism in it, but when you walked out the doors, 30 miles away was Mount Rainier. The setting was breathtaking. Then I pastored in a little church up in Walnut Grove. If you're ever in Walnut Grove and you can go by Walnut Grove Community Church or Walnut Grove Community Presbyterian Church, however, the sign, whatever sign you may see, and you go inside there, you see um, uh, it looks like it came out of New England, except it's all done in Redwood, but you have a miniature cathedral. It's just an amazing chapel. So it's one of those kind of facilities that when you walk into it, um, you ask permission if it's okay to speak. Um, that's kind of how I feel about the little chapel up on Highway 1 with the uh, Spaniard hat on it. And it's just a gorgeous little cathedral up there. I mean, little worship center. At West Valley, I don't know if you can imagine it, sanctuary was about four times the size of this. It was incredibly beautiful. The entire interior was redwood and uh, pine going up into the, into the rafters and everything. It was just, it was just magnificent. Um, it was built back in the 1950s. The reason for all the redwood is because it was the cheapest wood available. Uh, today, who knows the insurance value of that sanctuary? The windows were not traditional stained glass windows. They didn't have enough money to buy stained glass windows. They were glass blocks. Um, all the different colors that are imaginable. Narrow, high. Um, the room just well, it was like a, just color everywhere. However, at the front of the sanctuary where our cross is, was a cross made out of those blocks. Not as wide as yours, narrower. 33 feet tall. One foot for every life, for every year of Christ's life. Right in the center where the two arms of the cross connect was one clear piece of glass. It symbolized the purity and righteousness of God. You're in the top three. I think you have one of the most beautiful visual images in a sanctuary that you could ever have. In a short period of time, I've been here. Can't tell you how many people have walked in here. Pastors in the community, when they've come here for a ministerial association breakfast, come into this sanctuary for the first time. I think it's almost a unanimous consensus. This is the most beautiful sanctuary and worship space in the county. Oftentimes, they'll just sit down in a pew and gaze at that cross. And, and I hope that you fully appreciate that. I mean, we, many of us know the history from the Feriolas who put it together, but this, this cross is just so full of biblical imagery. This cross is a magnificent focal point 
for why we are here. And, and, and you know, immediately you, you see the vines coming through the cross, and that's the reason why I want to focus on those vines and the symbolism of them at the first Sunday of, of September. But we have the cross. And when I look at that cross, oftentimes, yes, I'm, I'm mindful of Jesus' death and his resurrection. It's the, kind of the two focal points between Catholicism and Protestantism. Catholicism focuses on the death of Christ. Protestantism focuses on the resurrection of Christ, and that's the reason why most Protestant churches do not have a crucifix. And you'll never see a Roman Catholic church without a crucifix. So in terms of a focal point, in terms of how they understand scripture and, and, and their understanding of Christ's death. But the cross is there. Christ is no longer on it. It's bare. So it reminds us of the resurrection. The hope that is in that cross for for each and every one of us. I love this passage. I jotted it down for you out of 1 Corinthians 1.18. And read the entire second half of 1 Corinthians 1. Read all of 1 Corinthians 1. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved is the power of God. Even back in the early church, the cross was a huge stumbling block for many. It was that moment of saying, I can't save myself. I'm dependent upon a higher power to intercede for me. It was absolutely detestable to the Jews, not only reminded them of Roman authority, but, but to die upon the cross was just the most unthinkable thing. And in the Roman world, the cross was the worst punishment to be bestowed upon a prisoner. So in the context of the message, it makes no sense that God would use a cross to make his love known to us. And yet, that's exactly what God did. The exact way that he chose to demonstrate the power of his saving grace. And the length that he was willing to go through the Christ to make it known to us. So when we, when we come in here and gather, and especially in a communion morning, I mean, it's just an incredible focus of God's love for us. And then there's the dove. I, in all honesty, I can't remember any worship setting I've ever been in in which the cross and the dove are associated with one another. This is a first. The descending dove upon Jesus. That moment when God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry as we know it. That, that moment of God saying, I'm empowering you with my spirit. Jesus makes the comment over and over in Gospel of John, I do not say or do in my own power only in that which God provides me through his spirit. But John the Baptist shares with us that that descending dove not only descends upon Christ, but also is a gift that is given to each and every one of us. In 
the same way that Christ was dependent upon God's spirit to empower him to do ministry, the ability for us to know God's transforming work within our lives is not dependent upon how hard we work or what a good person we are. It's dependent upon our openness and our willingness to permit God's spirit to not only work in and through us, but also to reside within us. And then there's the flames. It takes us into Acts. That moment when the disciples and those with them were gathered together praying after Jesus' ascension, waiting for those words of instruction, and Jesus says, don't go out and do anything yet until the Spirit has come upon you. Then go. Make disciples of all people. All of this funneling down, funneling down to this symbolism of the table before us. And, and we know the words well. Jesus says to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat, all of it in remembrance of me. And then taking one of the cups during the Passover meal and pouring it, passing it around to his disciples, encouraging them to take a drink. This cup is my blood for you, for the new relationship that I desire to have with each and every one of you. But, but there's a passage of scripture that we miss oftentimes. We stop there because if you read a little bit further in verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 11, it says, don't come to this table in an unworthy manner. In other words, just don't take it for granted. Don't respect everything this table represents. Don't ever take it for granted. He goes on to say, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. What it means is before we partake of this, Im this, this immense gift, don't come up here with a sense of entitlement. Don't do not not take advantage of all that's impacted in all of this symbolism that's here before us. Because we're not right with God. All of this here says that because of the cross and the gift of the Holy Spirit that Christ gives to us, that he desires to reside within us so that we can experience his transforming love within us. Don't permit all that this represents to, to get lost because you are wrapped up in yourself. If there's anything that you just need to bring before the Lord, even if it's just the simple prayer, Lord, don't ever let me take this bread and this cup for granted. Make it new and real for me. David didn't have an awareness of everything that we have. 
but he knew that there was more than what he could fully imagine. Because his words are not only a word of confession, they're almost also prophetic. Do not cast me from your presence, Psalm 51, 11. But look where else it goes. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. In other words, keep that descending dove alive and well within me. What's the result of all of this coming to this and us receiving it anew and a refresh? The very next verse, verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation, God, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain you. The end result of all of this is God restoring the joy of our relationship with him. We had a lot of testimonies regarding family. What's one of the best moments oftentimes if we are seeing a friend or family for the first time in a very long time? It's usually hugs and kisses. Not trying to be disrespectful, but in a very real sense, this table represents God's hugs, kisses for you, for me. This is a place where we can experience the embrace of his love for us. And all that he asks of us to receive this is to be honest with ourselves and what we need this day to maintain that relationship. Verse 17, Psalm 51. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, Lord, you will not despise. All he is saying to us through David's prayer is, don't fake it. Don't pretend to be someone you're not. Don't pretend to be in a place you're not. Just give it all to me. Ask me to help you. Ask me to forgive you. Let me embrace you. This is my body broken for you. This as my blood poured out for you. Come forward and receive. gluten-free bread, I have some here for you.
brothers and sisters, you, they're served. Thank you. We are among the blessed. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What good news for us in his presence for eternity. Join with me in saying the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and join in song. said go in peace and love one another as I first loved you. Proclaim to all who will hear the good news of my coming. Keep faith in all you do. And he said Good news of my coming, keep faith in all you do. And he said, and he said, go in peace and love one another as I first loved you. Proclaim to all who hear the good news. My friends, receive these words from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May it be so. Amen. Have a great week.